All right, I'm here to talk about buzzwords. So my name is Nicola Pinto, I'm from Buzzword Labs, and uh, basically, the reason why I said that is because it's really hard to have this conversation when you associate two like, you know, buzzwords like AI and blockchain. Um, but what I'm trying to do here is basically having deep learning, is it possible to have deep learning uh, help the exploration of the Cosmos SDK and find vulnerability? So what we want to do is have AI for Cosmos security. And I'm from Signia Labs. Uh, so the goal of this presentation is to uh, introduce this concept of AI code driven security audit for blockchain projects. Uh, I'm not going to make you swarm in, in equations and I'm hopefully going to get rid of those buzzwords, but uh, just stay with me. What I want is to spark interest around this non-obvious topic, because it may not be obvious that those two things could be validated. Uh, I want to show some preliminary results that are just fresh to the oven. And hopefully we can bring those two cultures together, the blockchain culture or cryptographic culture and the AI cultures. Because sometimes we don't talk to each other, we don't talk the same language, so it's hard to have the conversation between the two. And hopefully at the end you will be you will be involved. So the outcome of this presentation will probably look like this. A lot, a lot will be kind of scared, like AI, what the fuck, you know, like we're gonna get our jobs taken, whatever. It doesn't make any sense. Hopefully at the very, very end, what I want is you to look like this guy here, uh, which is like a little bit uh, interested in, and kind of uh, like excited about potentially being involved. Uh, so that's the outcome. Hopefully, at the end, we're going to get this in all these cases. So the outline, very simple, very simple intro, methods, result discussion, like a standard academic paper. We're going to introduce this concept of AI for blockchain, blockchain for AI. We're going to present our methods, which is very simple. Uh, we're going to keep it very simple. The results are already quite exciting, even though this is the beginning, and hopefully, at the discussion, you'll be involved. So let me introduce you the concept of, of AI for blockchain and blockchain for AI. So what is the main motivation between all of us? And what brings me here uh, to talk to you? So again here, the goal is to apply machine learning to harmful vulnerabilities in blockchain projects. So think about it like the same thing as DeepBlue or Watson, AlphaGo, AlphaStar, from DeepMind, AlphaGo, AlphaStar. Instead of playing a game where the goal is to win, let's say, a Go, uh, you know, a Go game, here the game is for the AI to win by discovering bugs, by breaking the state machine. So instead of, have, uh, let's see, so instead of taking from a, one current state and making a transition to another state and hopefully you win, what you want is basically manipulate the state machine with AI to come from this state here to this state here and at some point you win by breaking the state machine. So it's very, very similar to AlphaGo, the way AlphaGo works. Instead of bugs, you basically have like here a game of Go. Same thing, you can observe all the state, you can make transactions, you can basically go from one state to another and hopefully win the game. And it's also very untractable, you cannot explore everything randomly. <coughs> So who are we? It's basically the combination of, of uh, Thomas and myself. So Thomas, the CEO, Thomas Franz, was actually the co-founder of Ledger. And we were both interested in AI and blockchain, so we tried to get together uh, kind of steam around this particular project. Uh, let me tell you more about Thomas. He's the co-founder of the Bitcoin, Bitcoin House in Paris, also the co-founder of Ledger. He left earlier this year uh, to basically focus on scalability, security, and privacy uh, around mostly blockchain projects. And I'm also very interested in scalability, security, and privacy, but for AI, so that's why we joined forces. More about myself, I'm going to tell you a little lot more about this. I got my PhD in neuroscience in 2010, became an enthusiast in Bitcoin uh, in 2009, you'll see why later. Uh, then I, I was doing research uh, in neuroscience and AI, then co founded the company, doing mobile deep learning, sold it to Apple, and now what I'm doing is blockchain for AI and AI for blockchain. So let me tell you more about those 13 years I spent, and the reason why I'm here is not Thomas presenting, and why it kind of makes sense that we will be working on this. So back in 2006, I was with these two guys working in neuroscience, <coughs> both at MIT and Harvard. Those labs were a little bit different from other neuroscience labs, because what they wanted to do is both the reverse engineering of natural systems, so looking at biological systems, trying to see computational principles that could be applied to artificial systems, but also do the forward engineering, which is build real systems. So often those two things are actually not in two different labs, they're actually in two different departments. Those two labs that I was in, they wanted to bring those two talents together. So most of them were wet neuroscientists with monkeys and neurons, and uh, you know, I, I arrived with, with part of other uh, graduate students to do the forward engineering, so more of the AI things. That was quite exciting. One thing that we saw very early on is, uh, we are studying the visual cortex, doesn't really matter, that the brain is a massively supercomputer, like massively parallel supercomputer. It's close to 20 petaflops. So maybe we could just keep the principles of computation very simple, but if we apply at scale that approach, those of the natural systems, like even small mammal brains, maybe we could get some good results. And at the same time where I arrived, uh, we saw that GPUs were starting to take off them with computational power compared to CPUs. 
And so we decided to capitalize on, on that trend. So is it possible to use a gaming engine, gaming processor, to do some of the computation that you're on? <coughs> so we built a lot of stuff on, on our own, like supercomputers with GPUs, also a cluster of PlayStation 3, to do that kind of stuff. We're also teaching a lot of this GPU programming to other uh, computational scientists around that time. And got a lot of GPUs, got a lot of exciting results, which brought us to having a science editor highlight in, in science. But ultimately, what we found is that this technique was not only good for science, it was also good for uh, uh, industry. What we saw in 2011 is that Google was starting to use software papers to apply them in real products. So we decided to do our own company. Um, and the company was called Perceptio. We founded it in 2012. It was basically a mobile first deep learning startup. It was the only one that time. Our moat was basically betting against the cloud, but everyone was doing thousands of CPUs in the cloud. We are going in mobile first. So everything up in, uh, in mobile, that was our moat. Uh, we wanted to protect privacy. It was very important for us that you can have AI that you can trust. Privacy is very important. That's kind of bringing me closer to those blockchain projects and to Thomas, for example. It turns out that the closer you run to the sensor, the more intelligent you can be, even though those principles of computation can be kind of relaxed and simple. Uh, and at the end, we saw this company two years later, it was a deep learning tsunami, to Apple. And here is what I did at Apple. Basically, I cannot tell you anything about what I did at Apple, but you can probably see if you pull out your phone, everything has to do with deep learning. Before we arrived, but there was no deep learning after we arrived, a lot of the products actually uh, like, uh, infused a lot of deep learning stuff. So whatever is deep learning, face ID, face recognition, text, whatever, has a little bit of our touch in it. <coughs> so now the question is like, What's, what's after that? You know, is it possible to do something better than what we did with the perceptual? So if you look here, um, the problem with machine learning and AI is that it often goes in S shapes, and you know, like, there is a lot of hype and then a little bit of blobs of, of progress, and then it flattens out. If you actually take from 2011 to 2000, uh, to, to basically now, you can see this S shape, uh, S -shape uh, at play. So if you look at 2010, when my PhD perceptual was right before the tick, the actually first deep learning paper that brought a lot of the excitement was after we co-founded the company. Then we sold to Apple, then we ride it nicely the way at Apple, and now I'm basically asking the question uh, in 2018, is it possible to do a better uh, Perceptio? And that was when I left Apple last year. So Perceptio is true at all, like, and that's what brings me to decentralized AI. Is it possible to use blockchain for AI? And how would it make sense? And uh, just to put a perspective on this, I'm going to quote Peter Thiel here twice and just change a little bit of this quote, but what do you disagree with that almost everyone else believes? Like, is this something that you can tell me that you know, most people would disagree with? And Peter Schill actually says something I strongly disagree with, which is AI centralizes and blockchain decentralizes. Obviously, blockchain decentralizes and AI centralizes because a lot of the data is centralized in, in big companies. And I completely disagree with this. And the reason why I disagree is because I want to move away from centralized AI into something that's fully decentralized and unsupervised. So unless we are all in the matrix, if you look at our collective intelligence as humans, unless we are all playing in the matrix, in this case we will, we will be all centralized, we have a decentralized collective intelligence. You learn from your own experience, you learn from your own experience, and then we come together here in this, in this uh, event, for example, and we share. And that's how we get this collective decentralized intelligence. It's not centralized, not only supervised. So if you want to imitate human intelligence, we want to go decentralized. So that's my view. So I want to build collective intelligence, but that's so all scalable, which is nice because when you have a lot of people running a lot of compute engine running, you can make that very scalable because you're close to the data. I want to make that private, so you can choose a private scale use for obvious reasons, um, and I want to make that secure. So bringing into those three principles that are the foundations of Signal Labs. And in this case, what we want is really make uh, smart contracts actually smart, because it's kind of misnumbers, like the same as smartphones, they are not actually smart, they're more intelligence, more like programmable. The problem is that, it's, that might actually be too early. The question is, if the, if the, the technology in decentralization uh, space is not mature enough, it might actually be uh, too early. And if you're too early, then that's basically the same as being wrong. <laughs> Most of the time, even if you have the right ideas. <coughs> See? Um, if, you're, if you're too early, you're wrong. And what I don't want is to, thank you. But I don't want this to be doing your own networks in the 80s. You have the right ideas, you have to complexify them, become obsolete, and then wait you know, 20, 30 years to actually become relevant again. The reason was because they had the right ideas, but they didn't have the data, they didn't have the compute. So it would have been better to do AI to actually work at Intel or NVIDIA, building graphics processors for progress in AI, than actually staying in the neural network field in the 80s. I don't want to be in that sense, so it's important to have the proper timing. And as you can see from some of the results from this TED talk, 
Uh, timing seems to be one of the most important things uh, when you build a startup, when you build a company, when you build a project. Uh, so here the question is, can we help accelerate the progress? So if it's not the right timing right now, can I accelerate the progress of which the, the field is evolving? And if so, how? Since I'm coming from AI, my, my, my first thing was like, how about using AI for blockchain? Can I help augment your capacities so that you can develop blockchain technology further so that I can use your blockchain technology to do my decentralized AI, which is the end goal for myself. So before blockchain for AI, let's do AI for blockchain. So AI for blockchain. <coughs> the first thing that came to mind is, how about helping with scalability? One of the first things that's not helping right now, it's not working for now, uh, for you know, doing AI on the blockchain is it doesn't scale. It's not like fast enough. You know, already it's not fast enough when you do it on the GPU or on a mobile device. So like you know, being decentralized with like privacy or whatever might just be you know, not, not possible. So that we did something very similar back in the day, which is applying AI for GPU programming, or applying AI for high performance computing. So we could use high performance computing for AI, right? So before all of the GPUs libraries were set. Uh, we actually use high-performance computing um, like devices, like GPUs, and do machine learning to help produce the fastest code possible. So instead of doing it by hand, by just tuning the patterns yourself, just use machine learning for uh, GPU and high-performance computing so that you can use those devices for AI. So we did something very similar to this blockchain for AI, AI for blockchain. This was in 2011. And also, recently, Google produce very similar results where they basically use machine learning to tune their index uh, algorithm and basically kind of have a higher hit rate and lower latency. So it seems like it would be a good idea to use AI for scalability. Uh, <clears throat> but what would you optimize? So we chat with a bunch of people, maybe you can uh, optimize parameters that don't have a closed form solution. So for example, the block size. You know, most of the time in blockchain, we have a lot of closed form solutions, and as soon as it's not closed form, it's more like finger in the air, hey, 1024 bytes. Kind of, right? Maybe we can uh, accelerate the transaction throughput some other ways. Maybe you can have better fee or gas prediction. Uh, Bitcoins, uh, since 2016, uh, basically estimate smart fee, and you can improve on that. Maybe we can have something like a better block construction, because all of this uh, are optimization problems. And maybe we can even accelerate crypto implementation. So all of those ideas, uh, the ones I originally came up with, turns out we didn't do it because we switched to Security, because when we talk to most uh, of you guys, uh, they say, hey, scalability is fine, but first security, first security, first security. Especially the Cosmos people told us that. Security first. Then you'll see about making it faster. So scalability, maybe not yet. Uh, security, now. Why? Because security is paramount, you know, paramount for blockchain, and there is a huge reputational risk, if not killing the project, if you have a massive security failure. Uh, but why Cosmos? Because all those projects, to me, they all look the same. Why, Mr. Understand? Why? Why Cosmos, Mr. Understand? Because <coughs> really, from the outside, they all look kind of the same. Why would you go after Cosmos? It turns out that it was mostly about the community, not about you guys. Because you guys actually showed us the way along the way. You know, Adrian was the first one to actually tell, tell us about you know, maybe fee prediction, maybe UTXOZ uh, construction. And I met him in 2017. Chris from the same team, DevCon, we had a discussion around this, and Jay and Ethan around how could we apply AI for those things, and communicating in, with, with Ethan, talking about security and actual uh, ways to, to improve security, uh, basically this year. And also Cosmos has nice swag. One thing that you do really well is like, you have high quality uh, bags, you have, even I remember Adrian gave me one of those like, po poker chip, <laughs> poker chip with an atom. Actually, like, maybe I can make a quick aparte, like, where in the Genesis file for those poker chips? <laughs> but I didn't see the, I had one atom, he gave me one atom. Like, you, know, you remember? You made, you made those two guys here, right? No. You remember? You made those, where in Genesis, how do I redeem it? You cannot? You no. forgot? No. <laughs> Sell it on eBay. <laughs> okay, well that's not so nice. But the, the, the stock is nice though. <laughs> keep, keep going, keep going. Anyway, that was my dad by the way. Chilling. So why Cosmos? Um, more on the technical front, it's very sexy. Uh, blockchain of blockchain, internet blockchain operating system for blockchains. There is something to it that seems to be meta where you could use that as the, the ideal platform for this you know, blockchain for AI. Uh, and also it's used by many exciting projects. It's kind of launched very nicely. A lot of projects are using it. It seems like they, there is a lot of, um, I don't know, I, li I like this, this feeling of like being part of like something that's like accelerated really quickly, like before this deep learning wave. It feels to me very 
very similar, just launched. And we're also big fans of the project. Even before we got involved like this, we're actually supporters and investors. We participated in, in the ICO. We supported companies or investing companies like Castle Moon and Crypto Labs in various ways. We recently invested in all in bits. And we also participated in Game of Stakes. Uh, and we kind of won. I mean, we were at the very end, till the end. And our, our validator is called Bubu Nood. Uh, Bubu is a reference for, for my wife who's over there. And that's her name, so, Bubu Nood. <laughs> that's us. Like, Pointing, we don't see the pointer, but we were tenth at some point during the Game of Stakes update six. If you count by pre comics, we're actually second by playing a bunch of other uh, tricks by you know uh, using some of the. Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. We were able at some point to get some good results. That was mostly for fun. This is Bubu right here. This is the node. Just so excited about this. It's kind of fun. Talking about Game of Stakes, what's interesting about you guys is that you seem to take ser seriously security since day one. Of course, other projects do it too, but like. Uh, Thomas told me that Jay even talked about having a custom ledger hardware wallet for Tendermint back in 2015. Even that. And it seems like you guys are implementing the best in class practices, even though I'm not from the security field. Every time I see the way you operate, you seem to have a, a security versus security first. So it's very security driven development, but it's very slow. Slow like in hardware. You know, I, I basically, most of my AI work was between the brain and the hardware and software. So like, I like the way the hardware cycles are basically driving the software cycles and not the other way around, because one is slower than, than the other, so it makes sense that to have a security driving the driving force and everything else adapting to it. And what I don't want to be doing is basically what Facebook is doing, especially since your guys' uh, code is public, is that you, know, if you don't want to be moving too fast and break things in this context. I don't want to be doing the, the Facebook thing. <coughs> you also have many audits, you've heard about them, bounty program, and um, it seems like even the validators are not doing only validation, they talk about infrastructure and security around infrastructure. Even the beyond these guys do security around economics. I guess crypto economics, so does it make sense? Is it like, you know, do you have good uh, financial distributions? That makes sense. Um, and Interchain Foundation is obviously open to experimenting, so this AI buzzword thing, they actually got excited about it. Um, and one actually crucial point compared to other products is that you guys have a simulator, meaning it's a lot easier to apply some of the things I'm going to talk about. So let's talk about the methods. Uh, the project name is called Icarus. Uh, that's the proposal we did uh, that, like, a month or two ago. I don't remember exactly, but Icarus, a deep cosmos father, deep learning, deep cosmos, Icarus, it's like the, the furthest away constellation. And we'll only scale the bug discovery for, for cosmos again. So talking about AI, I, don't, I, like, I, don't, I hate this term AI actually, because the hype is so detached from reality, especially because of the price. Uh, what I want to talk instead is not about what AI is today, which is the glorified kind of guided random search. That's really what it is, mostly brute force. Uh, and when talk, people talk about AI, they're afraid about the centralization and disrupting jobs. What I want to talk about here is more IA, which is intelligence augmentation and augmenting your capacity. So that's mostly what I mean when I talk about AI, I basically mean IA. What I want is this to be decentralized, obviously, but also empowered developments. So instead of having the those colors like, you know, basically displace the blue colors, or I mean the white colors displace the blue colors, there's a new class which I call pyjama uh, colors, that are basically just here to augment everyone. Um, so the first thing we did is <coughs> try to do fuzzing, basically that's the simplest, mm, dynam dynamical way, it's very easy. We also have long shots in terms of ideas. We want to make some sort of relaxation or formal verification, because we see the um, dynamic and static verification as uh, kind of a, a spectrum. Maybe there is a way to have most of the juice of formal verification, which is very slow and tedious mathematically, and having a little bit of relaxation where you put some deep learning, which is more statistical or whatever, like what they do in physics when they cannot have certain equations that scale, they start using machine learning for it. Uh, we also want to do some source code at the source code level analysis to predict the probability of a bug, a potential issue, like an auditor would do. For example, here, if you look at this particular bug that was fixed, so it's a state transition from this code, oops, from this code base to this code, right? Just a diff. That's the same trans, uh, uh, state, transaction, like trans transition, and another state. If the machine can learn that those guys could potentially be problematic and need to be fixed, it's not, not going to necessarily predict that, but it's going to maybe tell you about this. It will obviously simulate what a developer or an auditor does, which is like, oh, this looks like something I've seen already, there might be some issue, and create some hotspots there. Maybe if you can generalize that to other languages, other projects, you can learn from the entire Git history of what is a composition of a Git diff uh, based on pull requests and bugs and tags and whatever. It's a, it's a, it's a very, probably not going to work, but if that works, that would be uh, amazing. 
And if you have that, you can also have a coverage group guided tool that will hit those hotspots differently. So first thing we did is interview a bunch of people. So we had these original ideas, we wanted to confront them with reality. We, we uh, talked uh, people at Tendermint, obviously, Prince J. Eaton, Zaki, Anton, Jesse, Alex, and of course, validators, Adrian, Gauthier, Hendrik, and Young. Bunch of uh, independent security consultants to see how they do it, not necessarily blockchain, but in general, and future collaborators. And again, thank you to those guys for all the time they spent with us doing those interviews. What we ask is, what are your pain points? Usually when you develop whatever, like how can we augment you and how do you see those bugs evolving? Like, uh, can you tell us more about those bugs? Are they mostly in the state machine? Are they mostly in this package, this file, whatever? And there was little overlap in the answers. Everyone has their own answers. Some people were saying the simulator, the types, I mean, no, the distributed system, RPC. It was like every time we had one interview was a different answer. But there was no one, we were looking for one answer. So it would be easier to focus. So little overlap, there was a little, trick in this particular uh, context. A bunch of quotes that we found that we agree with. Um, Young at Yavis told us that it's easier to find bugs from the data than from looking at the code. So you can produce a lot of data about the state machine going around, maybe you can find easier bugs that way. Uh, also, the simulator is not really kind of fuzzing, it's more like an integration test. So if you can make it better at fuzzing, it might actually be a lot more powerful, especially since the transactions are basically constructed properly before they are executed. So maybe this could be improved. So we also asked them about bug coordinates. So let me unpack that for you. What we're trying to do is, this is the only math that you're gonna see, f of x equal y. <laughs> so what is x? x is a bunch of inputs. Inputs about parameters, inputs about the state machine, the state, whatever. The f is gonna be this, this sort of AI machine learning magic. It's gonna try to predict y. But y is basically a surrogate for z, and z is, the, is, is predicting a bug. So z is a bug. But Z is not differentiable, like, you know, it's really hard to find. Maybe you can find a correlate, which is we'll name Y, that something that tends to correlate with bug likelihood. So, since deep learning right now, and most of machine learning right now is all about uh, numerical, nonlinear optimization, non convex we need gradients. If you take bugs, so Z, uh, it's not going to be differentiable. It's either no bug or a bug. So, no, <coughs> nothing differentiable here, it's not convex, it's a shit show, you're not going to be able to do much about this, you know. So we need proxies, or surrogates, like the one last rule use convex surrogate. We need something else, and we call those uh, codecs. So we asked that about all the, with all the interviews. And what we want is to make sure that, that those things will be tractable. Uh, and what we got, uh, this is just a, a quick snapshot, things that you, you would expect, you know, if you consume a lot of memory and your memory leaks, and most likely you're gonna go at some point hit a bug. Maybe if you have a bunch of uh, Go routines going around, maybe you don't have a bug, five descriptors, stack that, all about resource consumption, gas consumed, which is surrogate for complex operations, block time, uh, if the block time increase with the block set, block chain size, which is actually the case right now, maybe you'll have an issue. Um, and of course, if the simulation runs longer and longer and longer, likelihood is, is getting longer and longer, right? So if you have long running chains that don't stop because you don't have any more validator, maybe you'll have more bugs. And also one thing that's very interesting is what Chris mentioned, which is cro complex cross-module interactions. So having different modules talk to each other in a complex way, they will probably create complex state uh, paths that will lead to a space that you haven't explored yet. And it's pretty easy to, uh, to screen for those because you, know, you have this hook, basically, keyword in the, key, in, a, in the code, so if you have a coverage tool, you can just basically hit those. Uh, so all, all, all of those are very interesting, and if you have others, please come talk, talk to me. So the first thing we focused on with those ideas was Amino, Jetson, trying to talk about numbers and types in the simulator. Um, most of them didn't, didn't yield a lot of uh, results. Jensen was too hard to re reintroduce the Jensen framework around what you guys did already, so we focused on the simulator. The simulator works like this. Basically, you just have a random seed that's generated randomly that produces a bunch of parameters for the simulator. So this is, uh, you generate yourself, or you've been out coded before, a bunch of simulator parameters. You can see it here well, we'll see it later. But a bunch of those parameters will be number of validators, like how, how long does it take to and JL, things like that, you know, like the, the liveness uh, transition matrix, how those validators will, will uh, uh, behave, whatever. This is really fast, obviously. And then you have the, the, valid, the simulations running, which is very slow, and at the end you have a bunch of output statistics. They will include how many blocks you run, you know, what is the coverage, how many lines you hit, how many of those were failures and transactions, uh, failures transactions, or good transactions, whatever, a bunch of stuff that's the output of this. 
So those could be actually optimized for. Simulation parameters, maybe we see it a little bit uh, better, but as you can tell, transaction sign uh, uh, signature limits, the max minimum characters, the state for the, the governance, how, how many states do you need, the evidence age, a bunch of those things that you probably have seen if you the block there. And the output statistics, again, the number of blocks, the coverage, for example, a bunch of other things around the transactions that were executed, uh, and signed and whatever. So that's what we what, that's what we took as an input for AI. Um, what we want with the AI is basically not run random search to all of that space, but focus the compute power we have available on interesting runs, things that will tend to go towards the signals and tend to correlate with bugs. Uh, so for example, uh, that uh, would be very similar to what you would have for uh, classification, if that's missing. Uh, so it's like spam, instead of having something that goes into a spam folder or not, you want to classify very quickly so that you don't have to run that simulation because it's not going to be helpful to you. <coughs> so this is the, the sketch. The same thing except here you have AI magic, which is going to tell you from the parameters if you want to run that thing or not. So that's very, very, very simple. Uh, spam classifier. And if you run it, then slow, but then the likelihood of that run being useful is higher. So that's what we did. It's very similar. The reason why it's called AI is because it's very similar to this Linus uh, double, Nobel Prize, double Nobel Prize winner Linus Pauling, which is exactly applying exactly this idea, which is someone asked him, how did you, did you get all those ideas to be a Nobel Prize winner? He said, hey, if you want to have good ideas, you must have many ideas, and then you learn how to throw the bad ones away. So that's very similar. It turns out it's more like brute force. It's very, very brute force -y. And what's really, really nice about brute force is that if it doesn't work, it just means you are not using enough. And I really love that because, you know, just like, makes the machine do all the work, and it's not that intelligent, it's very brute force -y. So here are some of the results of this brute force approach, again, very brute force -y. So pardon me if it's like a little bit uh, too simple. <coughs> so the, the, the first iterations were very simple, do it yourself, duct tape, like me hacking around. What's really nice about this setup, during the data collection, as you're kind of getting your feet wet, is that the training of the machine learning, the validation and the testing, they are all intertwined. As I'm running more experiments, I'm running more simulations. So I could find bugs just by exploring how I'm going to do this machine learning model. Even if this machine learning model is bad, and actually not better than chance, I'm still running simulations. So as I'm doing this work and spending all this time, I'm actually having like valid simulations being run. So any jamming during this data collection is actually valuable, because you're actually testing the state machine in different ways because all the simulations are under value. So it's not statistically correct in terms of training validation testing for this first uh, step, but it is still valuable, which, which, which I like a lot. The first thing was basically my laptop with a bunch of $2, two, uh, two euros no, uh, nodes. Then we moved to something a little bit beefier, 200 box setup, uh, with 48 concurrent processes that can process 24-7 a bunch of simulations. Here are a bunch of insights about the data we got. Uh, first thing we got, we saw is that a lot of the simulations actually die very early. They don't actually go, they kind of degenerate. They, they, they don't go much further than, than a few dozen uh, blocks. And then you have a bunch of them that actually go to 400, because 400 is, is the micro. Basically, the distribution is like a very, 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 very thin, flat tail, uh, which you are capping at 400, because 400 is the maximum more run. And obviously, if you want to have simulations that are interesting, you want to go the further away you want from this, uh, you can from, you know, the, the zero, and have those being kind of interesting. Uh, so that's already kind of interesting, so maybe we can optimize for that, having one classification, which is the number of blocks, if you, you know, likelihood of going to 400, so you have more of those interesting simulations. Another one here is like number of blocks with the time it takes, a few hours. Um, interesting pattern, obviously the more blocks you process, the longer the simulation. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting, and also if you, look, if you look at the very far end here, even 400, even actually a lot of those 400 uh, dudes, they, they tend to just run in a few, a few hours. So it's not because you go to like millions, like uh, thousands of those blocks that can necessarily make uh, too much compute uh, requir required. We already found a bug just doing this very simple kind of uh, data collection, which is a original thing. <coughs> so one of the first bugs we found was actually fixed after we found it, because we were on the previous commit. Uh, is basically dead, deadlocks uh, in invariant checks. So actually, one of 200 runs were actually failing um, in a deadlock way, meaning they were actually taking 24 hours, uh, each one of them. So that means after a while, all those 48 concurrent processes, they were all stuck doing nothing but being in that deadlock. So actually wasting a lot of computation uh, instead of trying to find 
other simulations. So we related this particular issue here. <coughs> here are all the bugs we found, you can <coughs> look on them online. More details, a lot of them were actually low hanging fruit simulator bugs, they are not that exciting, right? And what we want is to find really uh, critical vulnerabilities in the SDK, not the simulators, but the first thing that this technique will get is basically bugs in the simulation because that's the first connective tissue that, that it's hitting uh, before it hits the SDK. <coughs> One first thing we saw is like there was some non-determinism in the random generator uh, for the operations. And like if you change the sequence of uh, random generator calls, the same seed is not going to produce the same parameters. So a lot of those seed actually we are not producing the same uh, simulations uh, as, as, as we are predicting, which is actually quite um, important that they do because if they, if they don't, that means like everything you tested before is not tested anymore. We also fault, uh, found, found fault in the parameter distribution boundaries. So here, as you can see, um, this number is basically being sampled from zero to a thousand. Uh, it turns out that if the mean deposit is zero, you're going to have a bug. Uh, and a lot of those bugs will actually uh, change the way you call the random generator, which also will change the way uh, the parameters behave. But here, what you want is have the boundary being one, not zero. So since it's exploring and trying to go in certain directions, it tends to go to the boundaries, looking for something interesting, and then it finds that if you have zero here, it's not going to work. Uh, so this is another thing we, we found and fixed, very easy fix. Another of the same thing, about invariant equal zero, same trick. Uh, boundaries, boundary, boundaries. This this seems obvious, you know, af after the fact, but it's not that obvious. Obviously, people who coded this didn't know the framework much better than me. And sometimes you just don't think about those because you know, for you they, they looks uh, obvious. <laughs> this particular one is interesting. Um, if you have this initial liveness weighting, if the sum of those three numbers is zero, if they are all zero basically, uh, you have a bug, which is a rare bug to have. So one out of 8,000, you need to run, you know, the likelihood is one out of 8,000. <coughs> so by running this simulation going in the boundaries, we actually found a case where it's like a zero, 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 so you have a bug here. The fix is actually hacky. It just means that one of them will be sampled between 1 and 80, and the other one 10 and 10. It's actually hacky. What you want is not this. What you want is that you want to sample something where at the end, when you sample them, the sum is not equal to zero. Could be actually you fix it by having a one over there, one over there. So if you have full control of the parameters, this will actually be a better, the, better than this particular way of generating parameters. So it's hacky, but at least it's a fix for now. We also found something that's where at the end the final stake for a delegator is actually greater than what it's supposed to be. So this tends to be things that you can exploit to stop printing money, I guess. You know, that's what that could be potentially dangerous. It's very small, so it's not a big issue in this particular case. But it turns out we found one where it's actually insanely big. Uh, this is the only case where we found this. I don't know if it just has been fixed or whatever. It's also hard because you're adding features, like fixing bugs, so it's hard sometimes to keep running those, those experiments because like, the likelihood of finding them can be hard, even with this setup. Uh, but this is not a small difference. Even though the, the, I think the, the bug has been closed, I think it's still, for that particular version, still uh, producing this. The reason why we cannot reproduce this run on the current commit is because of this number generator sequence of operation bug. So if you use actually this guy, you're not going to have the same parameters, so you're not going to be able to reproduce. It's actually really hard to reproduce. A <coughs> uh, bunch of number handling problems again. <coughs> so another thing we, we did is instead of trying to optimize for, uh, I guess, number of blocks or so things like that that are simple, maybe we can optimize for coverage. And we won't necessarily find bugs but we will maybe increase coverage. Uh, as often, coverage tends to go down as you add more features. So here, for example, a few months back, uh, line coverage was like 61.5, went down to 53.5. Maybe we can help accelerate this by having this machine learning find better uh, coverage seats. Just trying to have... Cool. Uh, already, um, AI found some interesting things. So, as we were report, like, pointing to those bugs, the previous bugs that I showed you, we, we saw that some of them, by just adding a new seed or a new set of parameters that were producing this particular bug, this number handling, was already increasing coverage. So here, for this particular thing that uh, we, um, we reported, the coverage got increased by almost 1% just by adding one extra seed in the test suite. Uh, so that's what motivated this 
After doing all bugs optimization, again, uh, very brute force random uh, duct tape, whatever, how much, how much can, I, can I hack uh, into this, this kind of protocol? We found four seeds that were basically optimizing from 56.5 to 61.6. By having just four seeds, so it's very tight in terms of the code, just one line of code actually increasing drastically the coverage that you coding it yourself. So instead of you like going around and coding to increase coverage, the AI helped here. Uh, obviously, the more you do this, the less uh, you, have, you, know, you have basically less and less good results. Now I can keep running the same method with the very same uh, F function, uh, machine learning brute force thing. I don't increase the coverage so much. So I do more throughput in better models, better X, better F to optimize better Y. And that's where uh, most of the. So, <coughs> I need more throughput or I need to be more intelligent. If I had to choose one, I would prefer to be having more throughput, more brute force. You can just tackle more. And it happens that uh, a friend of mine uh, from the AI field from a while back, in the end of 2000s, I think early 2010 or whatever, is Professor Graham Taylor. It's, it's actually Eaton's ma master's uh, advisor. Like all, so he was super excited to help us. It turns out that they have a supercomputer available to do machine learning. He's excited about the project. Maybe down the road we'll have a paper with him, um, with some of his students. And he got us access to Copper, which is a real supercomputer super about to be decommissioned. There is no one there but us. So we have 24-7 access to this. 577 concurrent processes just crushing uh, the simulation. I think no one has, has tested the cost of CESIC as much as as copper. It's getting tens of thousands of simulations per day. Just, just like, even if the, the, even if the machine learning is just uh, random, who are you going to find stuff with this? So, so, and it's free. Okay? It's not 200 bucks. And everyone is happy. Okay? It's like win-win-win situation. You know, Graham is happy, Ethan is happy, I'm happy. You, know, you guys are happy. Everyone is happy. Anyway, so the future, hopefully, which is kind of interesting, that, like this, it's from Canada. So this type of computer is from Sharpnet, and it turns out that they have a new cluster uh, called Gram. Maybe there is a reason for it that has access to 35,000 CPUs and hundreds of GPUs. So maybe down the road, if we get good results with that technique uh, and papers and get you involved, whatever, maybe we can have access to this. Uh, and yeah, I think you can do a lot with this. So again, brute force, less intelligent, more about building the framework to use machines instead of trying to be too smart <coughs> about how you tackle the problem. So discussions and um, I guess some some uh, feature requests for you guys. If you're excited about this, um, I recently collected with uh, Copper uh, about ADK simulations with associated prof for profiling data. Uh, this could potentially be uh, used for the community in AI to do something like Kaggle, which is like a competition website where you publish um, you publish the, the, the data set with the something you need to optimize. Let's say optimize for you know, predicting coverage, optimize for predicting number of times you beat the hooks, optimize for number of times you have failures in transactions, optimize for number of blocks, whatever. Just do something simple like related data and we'll keep collecting more. Maybe you can have a bounty where you let the AI community on Kaggle tackle this and come up with a better F. Not necessarily better X and Y, but for them it's just like a bunch of rows with numbers predicting a bunch of rows with numbers. Right? So if you can have the other community with you know, money or like just fame, a lot of people do that just for fame, that could be an interesting way to kind of uh, target Kaggle for, for blockchain. Um, one thing that we requested at first is having direct control of the simulation parameters. So if you remember here before, what we had is just a random seed, something very random, and the AI was, after this, trying to classify simulation parameters, meaning you need to generate a shitload of, of parameters before you classify them. That's completely, uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's totally brute force, and that's very hacky. So if we can access the simulation parameters directly, that will be a lot easier, a lot better for us, and we don't have to do this uh, stupid classification trick. So if we could have the AI magic here, uh, then that would be a lot easier, so we can con uh, complete this. Uh, and it looks a lot like uh, parameter optimization in deep learning, where you optimize the parameters of your neural networks, number of layers, number of filters, number of neurons, the parameters of the neurons. It's very, very similar. Um, so we do use the same techniques, so vision optimizations, hyper optimizations, all of those techniques that we are used to in neural networks, they can be used. And what's nice is that uh, Alex and Miguel actually implemented this very recently. Just for us, so thank you again. Uh, so it's basically a JSON representation you can pass to the simulator that has all the parameters, which is just one random seed. It's better for a production of the bugs, and it's a lot better for us to kind of start manipulating those 
uh, distribution. So instead of just having random scene classification, we can start shaping the distributions to be in a direction that actually will produce a better state coverage, a better bug uh, likelihood. So this is going to be uh, extremely powerful and just came out uh, very recently, so I'm very excited about it. <coughs> so another feature request that, uh, that would be very interesting, and actually could potentially be easy to implement, would be uh, if you can have better computational usage uh, for the simulators, if you can have faster simulation runs by having more optimized code uh, and less memory, we can run a lot more, more of the simulations in parallel if they can take less memory. Um, and also, if they are faster, of course, we can run a lot more. If you can also pause and resume simulations, you can have an early stopping of, of a simulation like we have in neural networks where you start training, 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 and at some point you say, hey, this one sucks, I'm just not gonna, I'm gonna get rid of it. But if you can have that in the simulator, you can do the same thing here. You run a bunch of transactions and say, hey, this, this is not gonna go anywhere, let's just stop and let's just do something else. And then you can resume if you require so. It's very similar to early stopping in neural networks. We also want to have what we call bug bubbles, which is a recent idea, which is could we potentially prioritize the sim simulation around critical bugs? Some of the most critical bugs, could you potentially have something that would, with a particular set of parameters, reproduce that bug? Because maybe there are more bugs around it. Uh, and that actually happens very often in deep learning, where you have a good model with a set of parameters. If you explore around, you actually find better ways or better models to actually optimize. So if you can have ways to parameterize the sim around critical bugs, every time there is a critical bug, there is some ways of parameterizing the sim, or having the sim kind of explore that bug would be covered by that bug. Uh, this could be potentially seek to explore also those bug goals. Of course, if you have full transaction control during the simulation, you're basically in a game of Go. You can just do anything to the state machine, and that's, then you can apply very powerful reinforcement learning techniques. Everything that DeepMind has developed for games, uh, OpenAI as well, you could use in the simulation. If you have direct access to the transactions, you're basically in a game of Go. Um, <coughs> Obviously, if you can have the AI produce the fixes, that would be nice. Maybe some of them could be suggestions. I'm not expecting that to work. Uh, and if you can have automation of the bug reports, that will be less time for the human to actually do them and more for it to do bug for stuff. So that, those are kind of obvious, uh, but it actually takes a lot of time to produce those bug reports. Uh, so there is a lot of surface area to cover, if you've seen, for this function. If, you can, uh, if you're excited about this project, please come to talk to me. There's a lot of, of uh, area to cover. Uh, we want to obviously engage you first and the AI community via Gram. I think there is a really good way. And please come make the Cosmos the most tested and robust project in software. I think there is a way to, to make it happen, especially since you already have the great seats uh, for it. So thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks first to Thomas who got me, uh, like actually made me commit to this project and made me commit to this ICF uh, grant proposal, which enabled all of this. Because uh, usually I tend uh, you know, to process those grants like NSF or DARPA grants that I used to write before. Like 30 pages, takes forever, you already have done the results so, you know, before you actually submit the proposal. Kind of a weird game here was just like a few pages they got excited right away and we could get going right away. And Thomas was the, the key uh, enabler here. I want to obviously uh, thank the um, ICF and Tendermint, Ethan, Jay, Chris, Alex. Thank you as well, Zaki, Anton, Jesse, the interviewees. Uh, Andrian, Gauthier, Andrik, uh, Yun, and Neil. Current collaborators, so Graham and Fernand, um, working, uh, especially Fernand as a collaborator uh, right now. And future collaborators, one of them is here, Joseph Turian. Where is Joseph? Joseph is over there. Uh, hopefully, uh, going to collaborate with us soon. It was originally the proposal. Also, our other friends, Nico Baldwin and Eduard Oyan. Also, my wife, Bubu, from the Bubu Node. And uh, hopefully the outcome looks a lot more like this guy over there. I'm excited, kind of confused, but still excited, but not afraid uh, of all those bug words. Uh, actually, I forgot about this woman. We're not here to repeat you know, the job, we're here to uh, augment you. And thank you, uh, thank you again, and please come again, uh, bring a friend, and we can, uh, we can chat more about all of this. I think I have uh, just enough for the questions. Thank you. So with things like um, uh, the violation of conservation of currency, uh, those are invariants that a human being will think to, to state ahead of time. Uh, can you identify misbehavior that does not correspond to any invariant that somebody thought to write down ahead. So you're talking more about 
identifying misbehaviors that will basically be outside of the set of invariants that we already have put in. Yeah, put it another way. Um, uh, we define bugs as when, or, or correctness when a code implements a specification, but we never write the specification. Um, so the question is, uh, how do you know that a behavior you're observing is buggy or not if there's nothing that was written down yeah. ahead of time by a human being that it violates? Yeah, that's a really good question. That's actually a very hard one to answer. No I have concrete proposal. What I can suggest is having potentially invariants being written by the AI or telling you, I have seen in quote successful runs that this pattern, which I can express in some math or some block of code, is always there. And then you can verify that this pattern, quote invariant, is actually one that you want and you've seen. So by just observing the data, you can see that, that pattern is always there and be okay, I'm gonna actually out code it as an invariant. And that was a suggestion, not this particular one, but having the AI help for the invariant writing invariant is a suggestion that Alex mentioned, um, which I think we can do, it's a little tricky, but you can potentially observe the state and be hey, this is constant. This state here is constant. Is it possible to actually make it a, make a suggestion to the human? It's gonna be tricky, but I think there is a path there, maybe uh, simple ones, because obviously if you don't have an invariant, you're not gonna have a panic, as you said. Does that answer your question? Yes. Any other question? So this actually isn't a, isn't a question for you. Um, I wanted to thank you for an awesome presentation. Use this as an opportunity to plug the granting program we've been running at the foundation. Um, yeah, thank you. So this this was obviously one of the you know kind of not directly on any kind of roadmap that anyone was thinking about, and they showed up, and there was this crazy idea to like apply AI to blockchain. We were all kind of excited about it. The proposal came in. It was really nice. And and just to kind of just kind of point out how we do these reviews and, and what we think about. It. I mean, the foundation has a lot of money, but that doesn't mean we just give everyone all the money they asked for. And you know, part of what they were asking for was money to run on GPUs, and you know, we were a little bit uncomfortable, like, well, we don't know how much band, how much they're gonna use, and like, do we give them money up front, or how would we like track how much they use, and so on, and then it hit us, like, oh, you know, my, my professor that I wrote my master's thesis on ten, Tendermint with um, has all this spare compute capacity. Maybe I could ask him, so I emailed Nico, I was like, hey, uh, you know, my, my old prof, Graham Taylor, might have all this compute capacity, like, should I intro you to him? And Nico wrote back, he was like, you mean this Graham Taylor? He's like, he's my good buddy, let me call him. <laughs> and so that, that's how that all, all got set up, and now, uh, you know, he's just, you know, uh, the extra, basically, I, we, we kind of feel that it's our role to try to synergize as much as possible. And so people make proposals, and you know, there are a lot of other people making proposals, and a lot of other kind of shared resources in the ecosystem, and you know, we really try to put in the effort to see like, how can we make different proposals, different stakeholders in the ecosystem kind of synergize to, to create something that would be much better than what any one group, you know, Icarus on their own was already proposing something awesome, and now it's even so much more awesome because we're able to loop in this other stakeholder who's interested and cares and, and so on. And so, you know, as much as possible, we're trying to bring uh, the different things we're funding somehow together to kind of better synergize and get even better outcomes. So, just, just a short plug, thanks for the awesome Yeah, you did, that, you did that very well. Thank you. All the moons were aligned. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. My first time. All good? Okay. Um, I'm curious about uh, how you're representing programs so that you could do machine learning over a corpus of programs. Uh, in natural language, they, they generally use sequences. Uh, programs, obviously, you can, but we know reliably, unlike with natural language, all sorts of deep structure of programs, the parse tree, uh, the type relationships, etc. But my understanding is people have found it very hard to figure out what to do with these type graphs as inputs to a machine learning algorithm. Yeah, so um, the question is, is what abstraction, what representations uh, should we be using to produce this type of work? So here we just use very simple representations, just a bunch of numbers that are in input to simulator that's very abstract, very easy. What you're asking is like, you know, if you start using abstract syntax tree or some sort of code structure that's very graphic, it becomes super hard to optimize. Uh, and that's true, but like, you know, there are some better ways of optimizing this that came out of some of these AlphaGo work, whatever. Another one is actually the language actually has a lot of information that's not included in the abstract syntax tree. So maybe you can relax just having the abstract syntax tree complicated representation by adding a little bit of that information kind of leaking as the language model. The way we write this code 
Um, obviously, like if you have something that has underscore pointer, that's that's a flag, right? There is nothing in abstract syntax that's doing that. Oh, there, there is actually, but sometimes some of those patterns are actually not embedded in the programming languages, and they are actually generalizable across many different languages. So looking at the code plus the abstract syntax tree might be the answer. Where some of the stuff that's too hard the abstract syntax tree, you can actually start looking at the actual code. The same way Nodeer does that. I mean, I don't have a representation of the, the tree and the graph in my head. I just look at the code. And I, oh, maybe this. You know, there is a malloc here. Oh, maybe there is a buffer overrun somewhere, right? And that's the way we do it by just looking at characters. Um, so since natural language processing is becoming so powerful these days, maybe there is hope to start relaxing this complicated problem with those techniques, especially since you have GitHub, uh, just Git storage in general, pull request issues that had inject so much more meta information onto those code changes. So uh, you know, maybe at very large scale, you could start having those uh, you know, learn on GitHub. Very helpful for that, probably not going to work. If that works, that's a probably a major breakthrough for software. Um, but you know, this is very hard to implement, and we are just you know, two or three working on this. So, so. If you want to come help? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank I you. think we can all go home now. That was too amazing. We just, do you need this to drop? I'm just asking. No. <laughs> we'll break for just a couple of seconds and let the next um, the next session get ready, which will be a panel on identity with uh, a few of our, our favorite folks with very large, brilliant minds. <laughs>